Welcome on in, everybody, to a victory edition of the Porpoise Pod. Brendan Tobin here alongside my co-host Alejandro Solana. Good to be porping with you again, and good to be porping with you again after a win, Solana. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, you know, I, I miss porping with you, Tobes. I it really do. I was off in the mountains. I was drinking moonshine, avoiding black bears, making fun of Tennesseans for having to have Ryan Tannehill as their quarterback. You know, although they have been rolling, they got to give them credit where credit's due. Uh, but you know he rides he rides coattails of uh, he rides coattails of Derrick Henry. Although they, they lose today, twenty to sixteen. But who gives a rat's ass about them? Dolphins win today, thirty to fifteen over the hapless Houston Texans, uh, who are now one nine and one on the season. Dolphins approved eight and three, back in first place of the AFC East. Uh, Solana, we can really go two ways here with this show because it really was a tale of two games. It was the throttling of the first half where the Dolphins jumped out to a 30 to nothing lead. And then there was the pain of the second half that was mired in injuries, taking Tua out for precautions, Skylar Thompson being awful in the defense, kind of being lackluster in really what was what it was, which was a game in the bag. So I think we should start probably with the good because the Dolphins did leap out to a 30 to nothing lead in this game, really did cinch it on up after a half of football against, yes, a very bad football team in the Houston Texans. But I think that the responsible thing would be to start the game there because that's really the story of the game is the Dolphins wrap this puppy up in a half of football. Yeah, no, I mean, the first half went perfect if you're the Miami Dolphins. Um, there were a couple drives that ended in field goals, whatever. You know, your defense makes plays. You dominated uh, every level of the game. And uh, it was exactly what you were hoping this would be, a laugher against a really bad team who – is in the midst of a quarterback change and they have Kyle Allen out there. And until the very end of the game, like he was just absolutely terrible. It got to a point where I almost felt bad for the Texans watching this one. And I'm just thinking, you know, Dolphins are going to put 50 on them. I really thought we'd, we'd see a 50 burger today. And, uh, and you know, um, whether it was the defense forcing turnovers, whether it was Tua just connecting with Waddle and Tyreek, um, it was a pretty flawless first half for the Miami Dolphins. Other, than, I guess they didn't get their running game going, Tobin. But, I mean, you live with it when on first and second downs, two was connecting with Waddle and uh, and Tyreek for chunk plays again. Like, it was, it was everything you wanted to see from the Dolphins after their bye week. Well, it was really well-rounded, right? Like, that, this, this was a, a team that had been very offensive-centric. We have seen better performances from the defense, but – you know, we had not seen. I think. I think they said the stat on TV today was it hasn't been an interception since week seven, and yeah. the turnovers really returned, and the Dolphins really cashed in on them. That was a, a big, big story of this game, and that that has not been an element of this Dolphins team that they have had, which was I think surprising to a lot of us coming into the season. This was a team that was very good at, at turning over the football, uh, but Von Ginks getting it going really setting up an easy touchdown. It really well probably was a disappointing drive uh, on the on the front end of it because you know the Dolphins you know did stutter out a couple times where it looked like they were really humming along and then Tua couldn't miss and then there were just a few that were just a tick off and it just they you know it it just kind of spiraled into all right a drive that seemed like it was going to go uh, and be absolutely money and Tua was you know couldn't miss then it was just three straight incompletions and so you have to settle for the field goals but thankfully. You know, you have those turnovers that kind of erase the mistakes of the uh, of the offense and put you in a grand position to get touchdowns, easy touchdowns. But even those, uh, like, I, I know on the first drive, Dolphins drive down the field in two plays that they pass the 50-yard line right away. And then, you know, Waddle has a couple drops, which is not like Waddle. I know it's happened a couple times this season, and today it was more prevalent. He had three drops today. Three passes he normally catches, so right that but was also, that was, and all, but also one of his best catches of the season too. <laughs> right, right. Um, but Tobin, at one point, even with all that being said, right, at one point the Dolphins had thirty offensive plays, fourteen of which were first downs. Yeah, it was crazy. So, it, feel, it feels like that. All it, it really there was one point where when that second drive stuttered to get to a Jason Sanders field goal, I think Tua had had eight straight uh, completions at one point. And I'm like, I'm just genuinely shocked when he doesn't. I'm like, either he's going to do something amazing or Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle is going to do something amazing. 
And he still had some amazing in him. I mean, that touchdown to Durham Smythe, his lone touchdown pass of the day, uh, that was some of the best footwork and elusiveness I've seen from Tua Tungavalo ever in his career. Like that, he really was incredible. And I think that, it, it, as a Dolphin, if you want to come out today with what is the biggest concern you have, it's going to be the offensive line because I did feel like even before he was dealing with the four sacks after Teron Armstead went, went out today, I felt like he had to make a lot of shifty moves today, had to, you know, get the hell out of the way in certain points. And it was an interesting talking point, Solana, because this was kind of the first shift that this offensive line had gone through, right? Like they found like they were a cohesive unit. Everybody was kind of mowing along. And then today, Austin Jackson is back starting. Brandon Shell is on the shelf for a little bit. He eventually comes back and plays a completely different position. But I think that to me was maybe the biggest concern out of today, not just Teron Armstead, you know, being injured in the second half and hopefully he'll be okay. But that, that to me was the one thing that was off is that Tua, Tua had to use some fancy footwork today. Yeah. And the running game just wasn't there. Like the running yeah. game wasn't what you expected it to be or what it has been the last two weeks. And I know Mostert's not there. So you don't have that dual threat capability without both of them in the backfield. Um, and then you're just relying heavily on Jeff Wilson Jr. giving you the production that he gave you without a Mostert in the equation. So, you know, that's a little different. Um, but I'm with you. Like the offensive line didn't play as solid as they had. But Tobin, with all that being said, you notice an immediate difference when Teron Armstead is not in there. I mean, yeah. th- not that not that they were, you know, fabulous today with him in, but <laughs> like – it was Tua catastrophic gets, with him. Out. Tua gets sacked three times, I think, on a, on a single drive in the second half. The Dolphins had 35 yards um, with six minutes left in the fourth quarter um, in the second half. Like, it, you could not move the ball. And I saw Adam Beasley tweet out. And, you know, I was, I was the, uh, the leader of the Skylar Thompson Brigade. But you saw Adam Beasley tweet out from Pro Football Network, I believe. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Teddy Bridgewater is active next week. And after that performance from Skyler, like, I get it, man. The game was pretty much out of reach. It really didn't matter. Maybe it got a little too close for comfort. But that was that was bad. Like, he, he did not look like a, a guy ready to play in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, look, it's such a strange scenario, right? Like, how many games do you have the luxury of doing this where you're up 30 to nothing and you have the tough choice to make. All right, should we sit to a, and to that point, the Texans that look so inept, you're like, how are they going to score 31 points? How is that going to be possible for them to pass you? So I get the logic in taking him out. And yeah, you had a, had a tough situation where Armstead is out and look, this is a concern with him. He has already dealt with a toe injury. He is not the most durable guy in his career. We know when he plays, he is elite. He's one of the best players on the team. But it, it's, a, it's honestly, it's a little bit like Jimmy Butler for the Heat. It's like, you know, when you sign up for this, there's going to be that chunk of the season where he's probably going to miss some time. Yeah. And so how can you deal with him being out? That's going to be a big question. But, you know, it's a tough situation for Skyler. I, I I don't get on him too much. I'm not like his whole, the only thing I'm, I'm a little bit upset with is the, the center to quarterback exchange. Like don't lose the football that easily. But other than that, like I don't want him to do too much. Like just don't blow this kid. That's basically your job. How, uh, how in love were you with the dolphins fan with the two, a chance for MVP oh, like halfway through the second quarter? Well, dude, did you hear? Well, obviously you didn't, you were working. So, I don't know if maybe you saw tweets about this, but apparently uh, to to steal a line from uh, from David Lang from Local Ten, apparently Tua had the greatest midweek uh, interview with the television crew of all time because Spiro Dides and Jay Feely could not stop talking about this interview that they had with Tua, where um, the CBS silent reporter, her name escapes me, I apologize for that, but she comes out with the story and says. Tua, I wrote this down. Let me see if I get the, the deets of this right. But she had said that Tua said that two uh, after last season, after games, would literally look in a mirror and ask the question, do I suck? And and like his what? spirit was was broken as a, as, a, as, a, as a player. He had never lacked that confidence. And he had said, do I suck? And Mike McDaniel 
his response to that, to that lack of confidence after meeting him this year was putting together a play reel, 700 plays of Tua being awesome in the NFL. That's what he had. That's what his first introduction to Tua was that like, this is, this is what you can be. This is the greatness you can have. Wow. And it was just, it, it was, it was Goosey's galore, dude. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was, it was so great. And, uh, he said that like having Mike McDaniel, having a coach basically convince everybody in the building that I'm the guy is what brought, brought him back from this dark place that he was in. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was, it was a riveting, uh, revelation from the CBS television crew. So props to them. Wow. I mean, that's like, that's like the notebook, but for Dolphins fans, that's yes. like the greatest love story I've ever heard. It's, it really was beautiful. It was, it was a beautiful thing. And then. <laughs> You know, on top of that, you know, Tua was uh, was playing well. Yeah, the MVP chance were were deserved. He's awesome and and had a really really great uh, had had a good game. You know, had a good game. I think I think even he will say like this wasn't his top notch game. Some of those throws that even Jalen Waddle dropped, I think a little high, missed on some things. I just don't think they were to, to say like to think about the high standards they had. They weren't quite as sharp as they even could have been, and probably could have put up thirty seven points. Or forty points in the first half if they want if they were absolutely crystal clear perfect. But again, you're up thirty to nothing. Like, what are we doing? I mean, it, it, it was it was it was a it was it was a beautiful thing to see. What what point have we gotten to where if two was not ten of fourteen for you know two hundred and fifty yards and three touchdowns by the end of the half, we're we're upset about it. Like yeah, the Dolphins, us. the Dolphins have a thirty point lead at the half. Tua ends with 299 yards, a touchdown, decent QBR. It was like 97, I think, 96. And and you won the game. And we're like, yeah, whatever performance by Tua. We would have killed for that last year. This is, uh, yeah, this really has been a, uh, a great season so far. It's been a great run um, for this Miami Dolphins team. And now, like, they're about to go into a part of the season that's, uh, I, I think, we talked a lot about the interest of this schedule and what they were facing. And I think a lot of people would look now what they're going to is this is kind of nut up time for them. Like what are they really going to be going into these three road games? Um, because, you know, after losing to and coming back, they took the fluff of their schedule and they diced right through it. And they weren't even close in any of these games really. Um, so that was an impressive thing to see. Um, but but now you go to at 49ers at LA Chargers at Buffalo. You know, this is I think of the determined Solana. You're a first place team. Um, are you really a true contender? And I would say to me, I look at the uh, these three games and I say, I don't think they're outgunned in any of them. Nope. Nope. I'm I'm with you. And and these games convinced me because I think I told you this, Tobin, uh two weeks ago when the Dolphins beat the Browns. These games against these teams, whether it was the Lions, whether it was the Browns, whether it was the Bears, the Texans, or the Steelers, one of these five games on the five-game winning streak, the old Dolphins lose one of these in, in like embarrassing fashion. Come out, lay a dud. And they haven't. They haven't laid a dud. Well, maybe the second half was the dud, uh, but it didn't matter. So um, we know the Dolphins, when playing at their best, can at the very least keep up with any team in the NFL. I'm not saying they're better than Kansas City. I don't know. I'm not saying they're going to go into Buffalo and beat the Bills. I think they can, but I don't know that for sure. But are they going to get blown out by any of these teams? No. We know that at this point. We know that. I certainly think they can hang with these teams. I mean, they, they brought up on the broadcast today, they were talking about, you know, the idea of Tua having the challenge of dealing with cold weather. Probably won't have to deal with that on this road trip. I mean, I guess San Francisco can get a little nippy and windy, but uh, we still won't really know the answer to that. But – Look, man, I mean, like we saw on Thanksgiving, you saw Josh Allen who, yeah, you know, we could say he's banged up and he's dealing with some stuff. But, man, for a, a team who the who the Dolphins pretty much handled in Detroit, uh, they were in a dogfight with them, man, and really had to pull one out of their ass to, to beat them on Thanksgiving. Um, and I don't think I, – I would truly think that the way the Dolphins are playing and the way that the Bills are playing after these past five weeks, um, you know, Buffalo could sit there and say, well, the Sun beat them. You know, they're, they're the only team that doesn't have to deal with the elements of football, apparently. But, yeah, I, I would say that the Dolphins are a deserved leader of this division. And I think it's right that they're leading the division. I think that they have uh, they've deserved it. 
They have, uh, you know, their lone losing streak is without their quarterback healthy this year. And, you know, with a healthy tongue of Iloa, they don't lose. They don't lose with him. And, and, and that is a huge part of it. Not only that his statistics are great, but his, but his MVP candidacy is legitimate as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Tobin, best start for the Miami Dolphins in, in an 11 game, first 11 games since 2001 when they were oh. eight and three as well. So, you know, the 2000, early 2000, 2001 team was still part of, you know, these, these Dolphins teams that everybody would consider um, part of that, that Miami Dolphin football era where people expected them to always be contenders. People expected them to always field a good team. Like those are the teams um, that, that were constantly making the playoffs, constantly fighting, no matter it, it, it reminded me of like the Pittsburgh Steelers of now where, I mean, pre pre Kenny Pickett, like you just always figured they'd be in the hunt. They'd always figure it out. And that's what, that's what Dolphins football was like late nineties in the late Marino's year, Marino years. You just knew they'd figure it out. That's the best record the Dolphins have had this year since those years. So to me, like this, this organization is back at that level, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I know it's just one year sample size, but when you're looking at the talent, you're looking at the production, you're looking at the weapons, to me, it's a no brainer. Like they're, they're, they're back at that level now where they're going to be a force for the next couple of years, but that window we know closes. So I want to see them. Uh, I, I was listening to Mike Cunio of CBS four and, and he was asked on the pregame show today, like how important is winning the division and, and trying to get, you know, a, a bye week in the playoffs. Should that matter? Should that be of the utmost importance or should just getting in the playoffs healthy be the most important thing for the Dolphins right now? And he kind of sold me on, no, get the number one seed, go out there and, and try to approach all these games as if you need to win them, right? Like don't, don't just approach this as, all right, you're eight and three now. You're pretty much a lock for the playoffs as long as you split these last uh, six games and go 500. Because mm -hmm. if they do that at 11, what would that be? 11 and six? Do I have the math right there? The, they're gonna, they're going to be a playoff team. Do I have the? Math? <laughs> Am I doing the math right? Eight and three, six games left. They win three. They get to 11. They lose three. They get 11 and six. That's 17 games, right? Look, yeah. Dude, you just confused the hell out of me. I don't know what the I don't hell know. you just said. I don't, what am I? I'm rambling they got six, here. So if they go 500 the rest of the way, they're guaranteed to be a playoff team. Right. But but don't don't just settle for that. Like, go and, and try to get the home field no, look, advantage. And, that and way I, you could play these games here back in Miami. Like, I think they're capable of doing that. Going on the road right now, winning two of three, and, and finishing four and two, five and one the rest of the way, and having one of the best records in the AFC – and I think it'll matter because they get to play back here in Miami. Not don't just approach this as make the playoffs. That's good enough. I would guess with the Dolphins six remaining games, they're probably favored in four of them. I would say they're, they're likely going to be an underdog next week against San, uh, against San Francisco. Um, and they're definitely going to be a dog going <laughs> into Buffalo. But I would say at Chargers, hosting the Packers in New England, and hosting the Jets, they'll be favored in all those games. So, yeah, your expectation. I think if you're a Dolphins fan, the the minimum expectation is they should go four and two, and they should finish with twelve wins. I think that, I think that's a reasonable expectation the rest of the way. Um, can we get nutty and see a scenario where they're five and one? Sure, we could see we could see crazy scenarios, but I think that the expectation the rest of the way for Dolphins should be. Uh, even with the, them being f even with it being four road games, I think that they should find a way to to win the majority of these games. And is twelve wins going to be good enough for them one seed? I don't know, but there, but they, but it's right there right now. I mean, yeah. you're sitting there with the you know tied with the most wins. I mean, Kansas City can pass you right now, but you're right there. It's not like this is a uh, this is out of reach for Miami. And I do agree with the 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 premonition that if the Miami Dolphins do have home field event. of course you would want home with it with an offense like this that's speed and uh, it's just like if you were a, a don't like the rams back in the day wanted to play in a don't like of course you want the best scenario and you don't want any elements trying to mess with you if possible and i definitely think that they have shown themselves so far to be good enough to do that and i think that's probably why you'll maybe hear some hemming and hawing about the dolphins a bit not being the best way to close things out. Yeah. But I think in a lot of ways, I think that's good. I think that the Miami dolphins can look at this and say, man, we, we won. We handled it pretty good. 
could have been a lot, you know, things could have gotten disastrous there. Maybe a, a couple other things break your way, but all in all, I think that you get, you, you get this win. You look at that first half and then uh, you, uh, you, you try and clean some things up to where, where, where did things not go perfectly in the second half? Was it just a matter of health? Was it a matter of the defense, you know, kind of slipping up and letting Kyle Allen get hot after they pretty much destroyed him the whole game? You know, I, I think those are all good things that you could uh, that are healthy to answer going into this next week. And they're going to have an interesting scenario because this will be a Dolphins team that's going to spend the next couple of weeks in the West Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, that'll be interesting at too. least <laughs> at least your, your biggest takeaway again this week isn't Jason Sanders is a bum. You know, at least at least you, you feel a little bit better about Jason Sanders going into uh the last six games of the season what what story what storyline uh is more i guess engaging for you tobin is it mike mcdaniel returning to san francisco mike mcdaniel versus you know the guy who he he really learned under and, and mike shanahan uh raheem moster and jeff wilson have ties like there's a bunch of san francisco miami ties because of the the mcdaniel shanahan tree or is it the second California game just strictly to a Herbert to a Herbert? Like, cause <laughs> I don't, too. I don't feel like there's any negative with Mike McDaniel. I think that's all going to be lovey dovey. And yeah. I, I think that that is cute, but, you know, but, he, but like, he wants to win it. Like, Oh yeah, it, of course he does. I'm sure. Of course you want to, you want just like when Shanahan and, and McVay meet up, like that's a big thing between them. But Juice, yeah, it, it's it's way juicier. Tua versus Herbert. I think that that's that's not that's not even close. I think but that shouldn't 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 we shouldn't we ride with uh, McCochin and like just 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 like f- fuel that rage for the the Forty ers game just because we know McCochin is going to want it so badly. Of course, and I think that there's going to be an element of you know you see you didn't think you needed me, huh? Well, not like they were hold you know like hold them back or anything like that, but like yeah. I'm the real genius. I, I get you, but but Tua versus Herbert, like that's gonna be that's gonna be a chef's kiss game for Tua. You know that's 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 gonna be that's got to be one he's really like in his. You know he won't say it. He's gonna be super humble, but like that's gonna be one where he's you know when he's rocking his little baby Tua at night, he was like, "Son, I'm gonna crush Justin Herbert. I'm gonna crush him. I love you so much." <laughs> Tua outplaying Herbert in that game and Herbert throwing a fourth quarter interception to seal oh. it. I mean, I may never return home. I, they might just have to arrest me at the stadium because I, I will be peak Dolphins troll in in uh, in L.A. Peak Dolphins troll in L.A. Well, I think the thing that you're probably going to run into is there's going to be more Dolphins fans than there are going to be L.A. <laughs> yeah, fans. That, that's, that's, gonna, so true. that's probably what's going to happen. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be an interesting thing for Justin Herbert to be like, man. All these guys really wanted to anyway, huh? That's interesting. <laughs> um, all right, we'll take a quick break here on the Porous Pod. We'll pop some bottle noses and uh, look ahead a little bit more to uh, this week. We'll get you some post-game quotes as well as the Porpoise Pod swims on after this. Porpoise Pod swimming on here. Miami Dolphins victorious over the Houston Texans. A Week 12 win as they run their record to 8-3, and 5-1 and one at home so far this year. Their lone loss being to the Minnesota Vikings this season. And the Dolphins, uh, they are back to eight and three. They leapfrogged the Bills for having the tiebreaker in the AFC East. Uh, the Patriots, they lost on Thanksgiving, six and five bums. The Jets, uh, who bunched, uh, who benched their milf loving quarterback, Zach Wilson, they won today. So they improved to seven and four. So the Jets, not, uh, not dead yet, uh, which is uh, pretty hilarious that, that Zach Wilson, number two overall pick, uh, just done. He's, uh, they, they've, they, they have completely lost faith in him. He's done, and South Florida kid Mike White takes the reins. And I think he threw like three touchdowns today. Like he balled, ball, dude. Yeah, he yeah. Ball, he balled out um, for for the New York Jets, who really uh, put it on put it on Chicago today. I know Chicago didn't have a uh, Justin Fields, who has been an absolute monster for them <laughs> Nathan recently. Nathan Peterman, Nathan Peterman started for Chicago. Woo. Imagine imagine how miserable you'd be this morning waking up in Chicago. It's probably cold as hell. And you're headed to Soldier Field, and you have to watch Nathan Peterman quarterback your team. Thank That's God tough. for Tua. Thank God yeah. for Tua Tagovailoa. He, uh, who by the way, he told CBS afterwards. Uh, well, on Mike McDaniel because they talked to him about the uh, the faith, the you know the the, the 700 uh, play reel. He says 
having somebody that believes in you makes all the difference. And CC, that's a Brian Flores, just so everybody knows. You wow. just just so flow. That's for you, dude. And you can uh, you could just take that and for what it's worth. All right, man. All for you. All for you there, buddy. Um, but the Miami Dolphins, let's pop some bottle noses here. Solana, um, give me a couple of your top performers of the day. Who's your first uh, bottle nose? You who are you popping it for? Um, I'm gonna pop a bottle nose for Teron Armstead. And I know he didn't play that great today. I know the offensive line struggled. But to me, we're all talking about Tua MVP, which I think we should be talking about Tua MVP. We're all talking about Tyreek Hill for Offensive Player of the Year, which I do think we should be talking about him for Offensive Player of the Year. But it's crazy to think that with those two guys on your team playing at the level they're playing at, Tron Armstead might be the most important player on your team uh, and, and critical to their success. So I like maybe today he didn't deserve it. He left the game early. I hope he's doing okay. But just in general, Tron Armstead, in in my opinion, is the most important player on this team. Yeah, he really uh, he really showed himself to be uh, to be quite you know he's he's shown himself to be you know quite the pinnacle of this team and and, and something that's super important. Um, and look, I, I really hope this is not something major because I feel like if. If they don't have him going into these next few games, yeah, that certainly changes some things. And 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 your in your confidence level, I think they've they've uh, they've shown some ability to do some things without him and be banged up in certain games. But you know, in a lot of ways, yeah, it's I would think if we're looking at it right now, it's Tua, it's Tyreek, and it's Tehran. Like that's yeah, that's your that's your list of top three guys. So I'm with you, man. Hopefully he is uh, he is going to be uh, okay. I'm going to pop a bottle nose for the most luscious hair on all the team, and that is for Andrew Von Ginkle. Uh, NFTF, a, a huge pickoff, Kyle Allen, a real uh, a real gift to him, but he took it down to the uh, the three yard line to set up an easy Jeff Wilson touchdown run to put the Dolphins up seventeen to nothing. Um, it was funny because I thought even in that I, there was a part of me when Morsett came out to punt the drive beforehand. There was a part of me that thought that Mike O'Daniel was still going to go for it on fourth and ten midfield. <laughs> like I still thought, like, ah, eh, he'd still probably like the way he feels the, the the wheelbarrow balls that he swaggers around with. I could still see it, but uh, Von Ginks he basically uh, nullified it. He got his own punt return and uh, put the Dolphins in great scoring position. So a great job by him. Uh, give me your second ball nose. Who are you popping it for? You just mentioned him. I'm popping a bottle nose for uh, for Tommy Morstead. Oh I mean, wow. Uh, I mean, we, we I haven't seen, seen him. him. We hadn't seen him since November 4th. Comes out today, six punts, 296 yards, an average of 49. Uh, 55 was his longest, only one touchback. Uh, we needed him today, and uh, and he stepped up. In the second half, Dolphins' offense was nowhere to be found, and uh, Thomas Morstead keeping the field position game in line with what you needed. So, Nobody ever wants to give love to the punter, especially when you don't see him for three weeks. I'll be that guy. Tommy wow. Morstead, I love you. I missed you. I don't want to see you again. But anytime we have to, you're solid. You're solid back there, Tommy. I like it. Uh, also, uh, I got a pop of all those for Laramie Tunsil. You know, just existing. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that they should have put him on in the ring of honor at halftime, but this man, <laughs> he has, he has fielded a, a, a feast of goods for the Miami dolphins. Maybe the greatest trade in dolphins history, uh, almost caught a two point conversion today, but as a good dolphins lifer would, he dropped it, dropped and, it. And so, you know, wasn't on the take <laughs> at all. I thought for sure. Like I thought when there was that one fumble that Laramie recovered, I thought that he was just going to hand it to Zach Sealer. <laughs> And just be like, hey, here you go, buddy. You know, it or, reminded, very much reminded me of like Victor Oladipo when he played for the Pacers, but was quite uh, obviously rooting for the Heat while he was on the Pacers. <laughs> like that's what it felt, yeah. that's what it felt like for uh, for Laramie Tunsil. But um, he gets my uh, my second ball nose pop for just existing and uh, and for having now for his trade leading to maybe the greatest era of Dolphins football that we've seen since Marino. It's uh, it's a delight, and it was great to see Laramie Tunsil today. He was uh, it, it, it was it was good to see an old friend. All because somebody – all because of a gas mask. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, what, trying what to, a, somebody, somebody seemingly trying to extort the man. <laughs> what, what, a, what, a, what a great story. What a, what a great story. All because of a gas mask. Yep. Yep. 
Um, a couple of notes from the podium before we get out of here. I uh, see from Ruthie Polinski's Twitter account. Mike McDaniel says he does not have an upstate update on Toronto Armstead's injury. So there'll be more info uh, tomorrow on him and Austin Jackson. We'll probably do a, uh, maybe we'll do a porpoise pod on Monday. Uh, Solana will give you injury updates as we look into the, uh, the week ahead. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, that's all we got from, uh, from him right now. Jalen Waddle saying after the game in the locker room from Yanni Karakis' Twitter account, he says that quote, they left money on the table, letting the uh, letting the Houston Texans uh, creep back into that, and I agree with that. They did. They let them. Uh, they let them feel uh, feel their way, like they had a chance. I thought Lovey Smith had some weird choices. That I thought really could have put him, his team in a better position too. So, you know, I don't know. First of all, punting when you're down 15, I didn't get that at all. That punting was punting down 15. There's five minutes left in the game. Um, I guess they ended up getting the ball back anyways. But yeah, the whole thing was was bizarre. And then, and then going for two that early in the both game, times, also, yeah. like cost them points. It did. Both, they, both they, they, they didn't make it either time. So strange game for Lovey Smith, who I think a lot of people think is, you know, basically one and done uh, with them yeah. anyway. You know, Houston's been a, a huge dumpster fire. And I believe, you know, to, to, to add uh, insult to injury for them next week, they got to welcome in uh, Deshaun Watson for his season debut. And then, you know, that's obviously going to have a lot of uh, eyeballs next week. But, you know, I, I agree with Jalen Waddle. That money was left on the table. It could have looked a little bit better. I am also seeing this, by the way. Breaking news. Jalen Waddle has penguin earrings. No way. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's baller, man. Wow. Do you have that a picture? Yeah, I mean, can I send it to you? Are we able to put this up for anybody? I'll just throw this up on the camera. Hold on, I'll do this. All right, we'll do it. Uh, we'll do a bootleg style. What do you guys need production <laughs> for? Hold on. Uh, Dolphins tweeted it out. So if you guys do want to see it, it's on the Miami Dolphins Twitter account. I just retweeted it. Uh, here we go. Look at this. Uh. Oh wow! Yep. Penguins Damn. with little snowballs. He Diamonds. leaning in. He he leaned in all the way on this penguin thing, man. I love Dude, it. Did you see? Uh, did you see the fans? They dress, I love the the fans dressing up like penguins. Yeah. And I saw Jalen Waddle said after the game. He says they were probably hot as hell, but that was cool. <laughs> and then some dude. I don't know who this guy is, but he uh, some guy somebody added me on this on uh, on Twitter. But some in- dude literally went to Antarctica and waddled with penguins. Waddled with the penguins. Yeah. Yes. Legend. Legend. <laughs> he is. Uh, that was amazing. I mean, that, that really, that's a, that's, that's top notch. So good for him, but uh, that's our pulpit spot for today. Everybody. We appreciate you guys checking us on in. Like we said, we will uh, likely pull up tomorrow night and give you a Tuesday episode to uh, react to uh, the injury updates. Cause that's going to be a big, uh, big time storyline. And uh, Solana, what can you say, man? Dolphins continue to roll in this magical first porpoise pod season, not taking any credit for it, but you know what? We're happy to be along for the ride. Yeah, I mean, I'm boots on the ground, Tobin, so I, I will take credit for it, you know? <laughs> you I, I feel like <laughs> – no, but but seriously. Listen, you uh, might, might – walk, walk by my – he might give you a game ball, you know? <laughs> he might. Just, There's, you can't just, rule it out. Walk by the locker room, and and I, I might have one. I Who, might just me, get one thrown at me. We pop bottle noses. Let's just say for this, for Mike McDaniel, <laughs> when we get his victory speech, does he give everybody the game ball again, or do only certain people get the game ball today? No, everybody got the game ball today. Wow amazing you know who i Every, think, i bet you i tell you who, i bet you i bet you jason sanders gets the game ball today just specifically oh, just jason yeah. sanders you know <laughs> everybody just a, that's just an up uh that's a that's a mike mcdaniel up his morale mood everybody but skylar thompson is getting a game ball today no <laughs> uh all right that's our purpose pod everybody we'll talk to you next time